And I'd like to welcome you all here tonight um, for the next installment of our program series. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to make um, a couple quick announcements about three things that are going to be coming up um, all in June. The first one is on um, Friday night, June 9th, and that's going to be the opening of our new exhibit, um, First Saratogians, all about the indigenous peoples, the Native Americans that lived in the Saratoga Springs region. So it's a fundraising event. It's going to be a fun party, lasts from uh, 5.30 until 8 p.m. And if you're interested, um, we have info at our table or um, on our website also. The following day, but I'm going to let Carol talk more about that, Carol's going to be doing a walk for us that Saturday morning before the Flag Day Parade. And then later in June, on June 29th, um, Mike Phillips, um, Jackie Bungie, our educator, or did I say Mike Phillips? Mark Phillips. Mike Phillips was my best friend's dad when I was a kid. <laughs> and that's true. Uh, Mark Phillips and, um, and Carol Goodat are going to be doing a lecture about the history of Burke's, Burke's Funeral Home. So that'll be right here in the casino. So I'm really, really looking forward to that one. But tonight, we have um, a friend of many of ours who's going to be doing a lecture for us. So I'm very happy to introduce Carol Daggs. Carol is a multifaceted creative. She's the author of multiple publications, an educator, a renowned musician, and she's performed at places such as the Apollo Theater in Harlem. She's also a massage therapist. She's a native Saratogian, and she's also a member of our board of directors here at the Saratoga Springs History Museum. So I'm very pleased to invite to the microphone Carol Daggs. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good evening. This sound is OK? All right, welcome. Welcome to the Canfield Casino, Saratoga Springs History Museum. And thank you, our executive director, Mr. Perilla. And um, I want to thank you all for making time in your schedule and, and in your budget to support the program this evening. And i uh, just like to start with this keynote, which will have images from Saratoga Soul Brantville Blues. I was blessed to publish in 2020. Um, some of you may have a, a copy already. And the challenge, of course, during the COVID time was that the printer was not printing anything except absolutely necessary medical literature. So everyone who was trying to get their, you know, their writing published was placed on pause. So that meant from March until July of 2020, I, I wasn't able to realize the print edition. But thankfully, you know, time has allowed for it to be a reality at this point. So um, I, I don't really know where to begin except I guess with the images. This collection is based on my family's history here in Brantville. And we'll take a closer look at some of the images. And I don't have a pointer, but if you look at the map on the front cover. You can see that that section is named for Brant, B-R-A-N-D-T, Brantville. And this map is from 1879, and you can find it in the Saratoga Springs History Room at the Public Library, but it's also in the um, Library of Congress archive. So I, I want to express my gratitude to all the people who helped make uh, Saratoga Soul Brantville Blues become a reality. And that includes the resources here in our community. Um, most of the work I was able to complete was through the Saratoga Springs History Room, researching at the public library, but also with my, my good friend, Ms. Fitzgerald, in the city archives, who helped me find materials that I needed. I'm gonna give you a wave, Marianne. And um, anyone from the public library here? I'll give you a wave just the same. And uh, you know, there were things that I learned in the research that really kind of blew my mind because I'm not trying to be cute, but I was too young to know about some of <laughs> what I researched. So it was quite a learning experience for me, and I feel like I'm a better 
person for that knowledge or to, to have that knowledge and the access because then I think the city archive had to close at one point during COVID. And then when it reopened, Ms. Fitzgerald was there again to help me finish, um, get my, you know, getting my materials together. So thank you so much. Um, I know I have further acknowledgements in the, in the back of the book, but I'm not gonna bore you and read, read them all now. If you wanna take a peek, you can do that too. All right, so uh, a little bit about the cover of Saratoga Soul Brantville Blues. We know that it is an, a neighborhood located in the southeastern section of town. And for those of you who are from Saratoga Springs or just know some of the street names, you know, on here it looks like a squared off area. And mainly um, it's between the two crescents. So when you're coming into town on South Broadway, the first crescent is Crescent Avenue, where you would turn at the Honda, um, the Honda dealership. And the second crescent, you know, is just past the Avenue of Pines, Crescent Street. So those two crescents, but then um, Jefferson and South Broadway, but not the full spans all the way to South Broadway, because some of that is now the dog park, as you know today, and the Carner Butter, blue butterfly trail. I've been on it a couple times. I didn't see no butterflies though. Just saw the sign. <laughs> Might have been the wrong time of year. So um, now you know that area is, is quite developed into a lot of nice, more exclusive homes. And uh, But there were still remnants of Brantville and what homes are there from remaining um, original residents. So the picture farthest to our left, you see a man and he's, um, you know, he has a garden hoe and he's, there's a house behind him. And that is basically my maternal great grand uncle, actually my paternal great grand uncle. So my father's mother's mother's brother, Uncle Howard. <laughs> and um, he worked for the city but he also kept his home in Brantville, which is behind him. And uh, I was fortunate to be the recipient of that home and upgrade it. And that's my residence in Brantville. And then the couple next to him, the two pictures with the man and lady are my paternal grandparents, Emery Daggs and Maud uh, Wicks Daggs. And uh, you can see them dressed up in their work clothes and then to the right in their, you know, their, their, fine, their finer clothes with their car in front of their home. And then the little girl with the bow in her hair is the oldest of my father's siblings that um, would be Aunt Ethel. You may have known her as Ethel Daggs Felby. Um, she graduated from Saratoga High with the class of 1929. And then the next picture with the four gentlemen is my father and his brother, my Uncle Juni, Uncle Donald, and their cousin, Al Sawyer. And then all the way to the right is my mom, Ruth, and that's her high school graduation picture. And I, it, I just will share that um, everyone in the photos now at this point has passed on. So um, the, the last two living people in the book were my Aunt Henrietta, who passed in March of 2020, and my mom, who passed in April 2021. And um, the next, on the right-hand side with the Saratoga Reeds, um, Saratoga Reeds chose Saratoga Soul Brantville Blue, Blues as their 2021 um, Community Reeds selection. It was a, a blessed honor for me. This is my, my first book by myself. I was fortunate to publish in an anthology in 2017, so it was quite, quite an honorable thing to be able to appreciate. All right, so you know that the book goes in abecedarian format, ABC order, and the first chapter is A for African Burial Ground, which is a, 
uh, I understand National Historic Site that I was able to visit in Manhattan. And um, I'm not sure if some of my, my family history comes from the African burial ground, but it was, it made sense to share it as the first chapter going in ABC order. But if you do have time and you've never been to Manhattan to visit the site, it's certainly a humbling experience. And this is some of the photographs I, I included. They just told me to cite that it was from them. So this is part of their collection. And it deals with the transatlantic slave trade, dispersed millions of Africans around the world, creating far-flung communities, a diaspora. Thousands were brought to New York City alone between the, eight, between the 1600s and the early 1800s. Their skills and labor and that of their descendants built the city and its wealth. You can excuse me because I need my readers. <laughs> Thank goodness for papers. All right. All right, so B is for Brantville. I thought I could just kind of supplement the keynote with some of the readings. So I'd like to start with B is for Brantville. Brantville is located on the 1879 Saratoga Springs, New York map. The area is located below the South Corporation line and was named for Isidore, and in parentheses, Isadora Brant, who in the 1880s is listed as a member of the Saratoga County Board of Supervisors. The 1870 census lists Brant as a 30-year-old white male from Baden, the 1860 census gives his country of origin as Poland. His occupation is cigar, sometimes spelled S-E-G-A-R, maker. Census records also give his parents' place of birth as Biden, but there is no immediate information on when his family arrived in the United States of America. Curiously, even though Brandt is 30 years of age, he is somehow denied the right to vote, not based on being younger than 21, rebellion or other crime. Brandt is from Baden, which is an historical territory located in southern Germany and northern Switzerland on both sides of the Upper Rhine River. The Saturday, August 7th, 1875 Daily Saratogian mentions Brandt's cigar store located near the American Hotel. In May of 1885, Brandt was included in the new class of lawyers by the general term in Albany, New York. Brandt apparently purchased and owned a number of parcels and lots. Southward from present day Vanderbilt Avenue, once across Crescent Street, which is a South Corporation line, Brantville greets residents new and old who enjoy the proximity and access to the Spa State Park, Racino, Recreation Center, and the quiet comfort of older, humble, and newer, pricier homes. Brantville is obviously prime land that has been developed to the max with currently million dollar homes that have priced out many long standing residents of the neighborhood. As a lifelong resident of Saratoga Springs, whose paternal lineage originates in Brantville, it has been quite unsettling at times to see the swift gentrification and veritable overdevelopment of such a beautifully verdant extension of the Spa State Park. Of course, new developers have margins and bottom lines to make. However, it is with great sadness that little to no effort has been made to preserve with appropriate acknowledgement and provision of an historical marker that cites the important cultural history of the original residents of the neighborhood. And it was nice to be able to get some of the images for, for this opposite page from the Saratoga Springs History Museum collection that are available upstairs. And we're revisiting the 1879 map. Maybe you can see it a little better, more clearly here. 
Um, everything in green at that time was considered city limits. So interestingly, when you get um, past you know, a certain eastward boundary, it's all kind of rural. You'll see some of the names that might be familiar to you if you're a longer standing Saratogian. And again, the Brant allotments down at the bottom, just south of the corporation line. Chapter five starts on page 42, E is for Ethel. And I may have mentioned that Ethel is the oldest of my father's siblings, so my paternal lineage, I had eight aunts and uncles. There were five boys and three girls. Aunt Ethel was born September, I believe, 13, 1911. And this is her baby picture on page 62. Um, I, I wasn't positive the exact year on this, but I guesstimated it was around 1913. She looks like she's about two or three, right? All right. And this is her high school class of 1929 graduation photo. She didn't stay on the farm, so when she graduated high school, she took up dressmaking studies in New York City, and she stayed in Harlem with family that was already established in New York City. And the next chapter, six, F is for farming. And if you do have your book and you want to follow along, I'll just read a few paragraphs from, from chapter six. Today, many people struggle with the realities of locating, qualifying for, and maintaining appropriate, affordable housing for themselves and their families. Many in search of a practical living situation are sometimes working homeless. People work full time, sometimes even several jobs, and are still unable to make ends meet and house themselves. I didn't realize how real this matter is until I recently drove to the local train station. With it being winter, one can actually see the tarps and tent village where some people manage to maintain an outdoor living situation. With all the new apartment complexes and condominiums being built, I honestly wonder what all will change for the folks who so urgently need housing the most. With all the current local debate and exchange surrounding affordable housing, it occurs to me that there is a time in Saratoga Springs history when our neighborhood, being south of the city corporation line, remains unaffected by much of what takes place on the other side of the line, which today is Crescent Street. While we have no current historical marker, this section of town is historically known as Brantville, established by Isidore Brant, who appears on the 1879 Saratoga Springs New York map, and in 1883 is listed as a member of the Saratoga County Board of Supervisors. I'm standing corrected because we do have a um, historic marker sign that was granted through the William G. Pomeroy Foundation, but I'll tell you more about that later. This is great-grand-uncle Howard, who is my father's mother's mother's brother. And uh, you can see that he was no stranger to farming, and uh, he was also a city laborer, so between his city gig and Brantville gig, he was able to maintain his home, which is pictured behind him. <clears throat> Excuse me. And for those of you who maybe walk in the neighborhood, if you are on the Joshua Road side and you have a look from that side, it's the last lot that they just dug and flattened, so I'm wondering what they're doing with it. Probably gonna build another house. Then I won't be able to see all the way through to Joshua. But anyway, um, it's grown in now and there are a lot of trees, so it looks nothing like this photo now. 
Chapter seven, G is for grandparents, graduates, and girls. Since the late 1800s to present, Brantville is and remains home to my family and newer families who arrive over the past 20 some years. As previously mentioned, this area of town lies south of the city corporation line, which is Crescent Street. Brantville lies just one block west of the Racino. Excuse me. Longstanding residents pay taxes over many years. However, for quite a long time, residents have no city sewer, gas, or water, and rely on wells to supply their water, outhouses and septic systems, coal, wood, and home heating fuel oil. Our late father, Richard, is the youngest of the eight Dags children. He was born in 1932 at McCarty's Hospital, which has long been known as Anne's Washington Inn on South Broadway. Pictured together are grandfather Emery Daggs Sr. and grandmother Maud Wicks Daggs. The contrast of their dress in the images gives an appreciation of their farm work ethic and more formal attire with their automobile in front of their Brantville home. The two girls have uncertain identity. Some say that one may be our cousin Carla. Note the chickens in the background and hay supply that is as tall as the trees. The girls dress so nicely with stocking caps to protect their hair. They may be ready for church. Ethel is also featured in her class of 1929 Saratoga Springs High School graduation photo. And I'm com coming to appreciate that the two girls are um, more than likely Aunt Margaret and Aunt Henrietta because in most of the pictures, really all the pictures that I saw of them, they're always together. They're just two years apart, but they were like, you know, besties. Chapter 10, J is for jam session. And this is left or right, I think we mentioned before. Um, my father, Richard, is standing with a guitar. You can see he had a really nice Gibson. I don't wonder how long it took him to save up for that, but then Uncle Junie is seated, Uncle Donald, and Cousin Al Sawyer. So of the four, two of them served in the United States military. I know Uncle Donald's brick is out on the Walk of Honor. Um, and I want to say that Cousin Al was in the Army, and Uncle Donald was in the Army as well. Uncle Junie. Unfortunately, he cut off his trigger, trigger finger when he was a little boy, so he was disqualified from enlistment. I won't give it all away. It's in here. <laughs> 12, L is for lovely ladies. And this is the lovely ladies of the Monarch Temple Marching Club, Congress Street, circa 1947. Um, Three of my aunts are in this photo. And if, if some of you know some of the ladies that I was not able to identify, maybe you'll give me a shout. But at the far left, the tall lady with the cat glasses is my Aunt Margaret and the puffy sleeves. And then um, all the way over second in from the right is Aunt Ethel. She's kind of shorter, a little bit shorter between the two ladies, and she, her head is slightly tilted. And then directly in front of Aunt Ethel, seated in the sleeveless gown, is my Aunt Janie. And my mom did let me know that when, when we were looking at these photos, the lady seated at the table on the right in the rear, my mom, she thought that that was Miss Hattie Mosley Austin who owned Hattie Shake and Jack. I don't know if any of you all would be able to say yay or nay, but that was what my mom thought. All right, chapter 16. P is for Papa, Parents, Play Pals, Pigs, and Potatoes. And this is an image of our paternal grandfather, Emery Dagg Sr. This is um, circa 1925. 
This was from uh, Ethel's scrapbook. You can see she wrote Dad underneath, and it's 1925. Um, my grandfather did have a rubbish business, Dag's Refuse. Some of you might remember the, um, the big red compactor truck back in the day, like in the 80s. But after he passed, my Uncle Donald and Cousin Bill were able to keep the uh, business for some while, but then um, had to let it go. And my, my grandfather was one of, I think, five children, but they lost a, a girl. They lived in Amsterdam, and his father passed away when he was two years old, and that is why they came back. I didn't know it was back to Saratoga. I thought, oh, they just moved to Saratoga. But in my research, I learned that his mother who was a hazard, she already had family established here from like back to the 1850s. So, oh, I wanna tell you a story about Uncle Will, who is Grandpa Emery's brother. They were 14 months apart. I'll tell you that one in a little bit. Kinda drama. We got drama. We don't need no Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now this is a, a photo from Doton Avenue. You can see the number four is on the side of the house. And this is my father, Richard, on the left, a shorter chubby boy, and my uncle Joe. They were 11 months apart. And, uh, you know, I always marvel at, at their their brotherhood, but their friendship throughout their lives. And, you know, even when we were growing up, that was plainly evident to us. Sometimes we would go visit Uncle Joe, whose home was on Boston Avenue, right across from Price Chopper. And oftentimes he would come and visit with us. But obviously they were play pals from a very early age. And really, I do laugh. Every time I see this, I'm just like, man, those little dirty, dusty boys need a bath. <laughs> this is S is for supportive, sewing, sisters, and sorrows. From page 100. I won't really make too much mention of that because I'm going to share the, the U chapter story about Uncle William, who was our grandfather Emery's brother. But this is an image of our Aunt Henrietta, who was one of the sisters who raised my, my father and Uncle Joe, because they were the two youngest. And this is at her Ash Street home, um, at my Aunt Margaret and Aristide Karen's wedding reception. So, I always think about, this is the only picture I've seen my grandfather sitting down in. And I'm, I'm sure you all can think of, you know, folk who worked so hard their whole lives. And it just amazes me, he is seated, just taking everything in. And Aunt Henrietta is serving. Aunt Ethel has the flipped hair. Aunt Millicent. Uh, she's the lady with the outstretched arm. And I was, wasn't really sure about the two gentlemen with the ties, but I really do believe that that is my Uncle Joe and my dad, because the profile from the jam session picture with the guitar, it is just so similar to the man in the white shirt. I can't really see his face, but I'm pretty sure that that would be my father and Uncle Joe arriving at Aunt Margaret's wedding reception, 1949. And this is my mom. I, I will go back and, and share the story about Uncle William, um, just because earlier I was talking with a high school friend about some of the racial dynamics that we've been hearing about um, here in town at, at Saratoga High, from which we both graduated. But um, 
this story is related in that way because racial dynamics can play heavily into the outcome of given situations. So this story is from the M chapter. And if any of you have the book already, it starts on page 75. M is for Moran, military, and mistress. This is the dramatic juicy part. <laughs> Married on May 30th, 1887, soon afterward, Grandfather Emery's parents start their family. Initially living in Amsterdam, New York, their father is listed in the city directories as a laborer, stove mounter, and tin smith. Born 14 months apart, the contrast in grandfather Emery and his brother William's differing lives and journeys is both sanguine and somber. Sometime after their father passes away, just before Thanksgiving in 1894, their widowed mother moves her four children to Saratoga Springs, where it seems that her family has been living as early as the 1850s. One daughter, Liliana, who passes away in Amsterdam during childhood, is actually born in Saratoga, but is buried with their father in Amsterdam's Green Hill Cemetery. William is a handsome, storied fella whose dramatic episodes are well documented in local newspapers. Somehow, it seems that he didn't get along with his mother's new husband. William rejects life in Brantville, preferring the dangerous drama of street life and becomes a wayward youth. In 1903, William befriends another colored homeless youth named Moran. The duo gets caught by police violating Sunday law, shooting a hot craps game on Ash Street when they should be attending church. <laughs> William has previously been expelled from school and seems to be in a downward spiral. Without family or a guardian, Moran has been sleeping in alleyways and remains homeless as the weather changes to freezing cold. When the duo appears in court, Moran asks the judge to send him to the Rochester Industrial School where the judge decides to assign them both. With no record of William's length of stay in Rochester, he later returns to Saratoga and in 1913, is still single and living with his lady on Monroe Street. You know, all those streets are named after presidents over toward the, the raceway. Anyway, in the absence of romance, one might pine for the presence of a paramour. William's lady is described as Mrs. So she may be a widow. She is also a white woman with a five-year-old daughter. The record states that the police are called to their Monroe Street residence, where at the time there is an accusation against William related to the discipline of her daughter. Racially speaking, one might conjecture that this should be the immediate end of William. The shocking twist and turn of plot leaves a most surprising conclusion. William is relieved of all charges. His lady is charged with endangering the morals of her child for living with a black man. Soon afterward, the lady is required to undergo examination and is sent to prison at the Downstate Reformatory for Women in Bedford, New York. This facility remains open and is one of the oldest and largest maximum security prisons for women in New York State. Her daughter is committed to an orphanage, the St. Vincent Female Asylum in Troy, New York. 
How this all resolves remains a mystery to me. June 1st, 1917. William is registered for the World War I draft and is living with his new lady at 18 Chapel Street in Albany, New York. He lives for 23 more animated years and passes away shortly after his 47th birthday in 1940. I didn't have that picture for this um, slideshow, but uh, that was a story that really, really um, touched me about how race and dynamics and and womanhood and marriage and single and children can can cause you to wind up in jail and lose your child. So we should finish with something brighter, right? Okay, this is quiescently quiet winters. I'm so glad winter is done and now we have spring, yay! All right, some might imagine that quiescently quiet winters in Brantville make for quid pro quo relief from farm work. While plowing and planting are on pause, animals still require tending to. Hay can be consumed by horses and cows year round. Aunt Ethel speaks of a king-sized turnip-like vegetable that grows nine to 10 inches tall. After harvesting, slicing, and storing this preparation, their bovine brood enjoys this wintertime treat of what they call cow mango. That was a short chapter. <laughs> I'm kind of hungry right now. I might eat some of that cow mango my own self. Oh, so pretty much that um, is the end of my keynote. But if, if you all have questions, I think we have time for Q&A. All right. So getting back to my, mo my mother and her high school graduation photo, the dedication page is basically this. To my beautiful mother, Ruth, and equally beautiful father, Richard, thank you both for being the reason that I know what it is to be and feel loved. And also to all those beautiful people in the world who have, currently are, or will serve lovingly, dutifully, selflessly, and sacrificially in the role of principal caregiver. I have some information here if you, and I do have cards, so if you are interested in the book after tonight um, and you'd like to take a card, I'd be pleased to share one with you. Uh, you can go to saratogasoulbook.com if you just wanna take a peek online and I just want to thank you for the opportunity to share with Saratoga Springs History Museum. Should you have further questions, please email me at saratogasoul2020 at gmail.com. Saratoga Springs Public Library and Saratoga Springs History Museum remain special places in the community where I feel welcome and can always go and just be myself without incident or worry. The staff is always pleasant helpful and just good to be around. I'm thankful for Saratoga Springs Public Library for being a blessed, lifelong resource, especially during this Saratoga Soul Brantville Blues chapter in my life. My gratitude to Saratoga Springs History Museum for coordinating and supporting this springtime book talk tonight. Soulfully yours, Carol. My artist name is Jazzage. And I think uh, Jamie mentioned that I'm a professional New York State licensed massage therapist, so I had to think of something that rhymed with massage that you know, embodied m my complete uh, artistic self. So it made sense to say jazzage massage. So if you see that, that's me. Thank you so much, and last but not least, oh, this was a collage of places that um, I've been blessed to share and been invited to present oh, uh, since, since 2020, since the publication. So, um, Troy Savings Bank Musical, Saratoga Springs Public Library, 
um, Albany Institute of History and Art. So if you wanted to go online and see that book talk, it's, it is available online. If you just, I think, go to the archive on the website. And Saratoga Springs History Museum, the Canfield Casino, and Congress Park. Thank you all for making time in your schedule to be here tonight. I, I so appreciate your time and attention and uh, look forward to crossing your path again at a future time. And I can take questions, that's okay? Yeah. If anyone has questions, yes, sir. As far, as far as I know, most of the streets have been there except for the last four or five years. Um, well, really, Shaw, which is now a corner to East Broadway, it, it was a continuation of Joshua Road, and it kind of curves around to the right and meets East Broadway, which has, has been there. It's really where the inlet outlet to the blue corner butterfly trail comes out right there matter of fact the last house on shaw on the right there's a sidewalk that goes around their house and if you just keep walking you'll be in the woods once you pass their house so i i can't say the developers i would guess push put in shaw but that's really the newest all those little ones, though, like uh, Main and Sulky and Bridal Path and Harness, was that like a development at one point? Oh, maybe that's the Trotter View Estates. Right. I think that's like right across from the Racino. Right. But those have been there, too, for many, many years. Not sure of the specific number, right. but at least since I was, I'm not telling you how old I am. Right. But <laughs> <laughs> since, since we were children. <laughs> And how old is the, the AME church and the uh, Baptist church? How long um, they the Dyer Phelps AME Zion church. I was going to say it was, let me say 150. I, I've lost track because I haven't been in attendance. and But I haven't been shooting the hot craps game. I just haven't been. <laughs> <laughs> it's not one or the other. Right? Uh, I think in here, in the C chapter, or the D chapter for Dyer Phelps, 18... I'll have to look. Right, but about 150 years or so. We can talk later, right? Yeah, sure. Okay. I'm just curious. You're going to make me do more research. No. <laughs> okay. And, and on all of it, we have shared in fellowship, but I'm, I'm not exactly sure how old Mount Olivet is. I, I know I could have put it in, in the book, but maybe that's the next book. Yeah, next edition. <laughs> Thank all right, you. other questions? Yes. Do many of your relatives still live in Brandsville? Uh, we have a handful of family that is still my next door neighbor is my cousin. Around the corner is my aunt Max and my cousins Clifford and Alicia. And um, some relatives who are just here for the summer. So maybe about half a dozen, less than 12. But if you'd like to come on the Brandville Boogie, oh, that was such a perfect segue. Oh. Um, if you'd like to come on the Brandville Boogie, it's June 10, and there are some really cool remnants that are still standing in the neighborhood that maybe people wouldn't recognize unless you were kind of on the walking tour. Yes, Ms. How many families live there? And that, that is a question that often is asked, and I just, at least from my perspective, and I know maybe some people have taken issue, that I, I only really just concentrated on my paternal lineage. Mm -hmm. I didn't really talk much about cousins and so forth, because there are a good number of families, you know, interrelated families with cousins and such, but I just had to kind of draw on my, my direct experience and the folks that I spent the maximum amount of time with. So that's another go back and look and you know really sit down and see who was where, when. 
My brother filmed my housewarming, which was in 1995, I believe. And when I look at everyone in that video, it's like so few remain. So I'm, I'm sorry, I can't be really specific with numbers. I think that's all right. Thank you. Yes. Last night we went to a concert at Lake Avenue. Our grandchildren were in a little concert. We got there early to get good seats. And I noticed there was a plaque on the wall that said uh, Saratoga Springs High School, 1927. Yes. Do you say your aunt and your mother graduated in 29? Was that the school they went to on Lake Avenue? Yes, her high school, where Lake Avenue is, class of 1929, was my aunt Ethel's so class. Two years old, graduated. Yeah, and um, she thinks that the building is still there and still in good use. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the And. <laughs> Oh, I was going to make mention of the historic marker sign and reach back and give Ms. Fitzgerald a shout because during the time that I was researching, I was just told about the William G. Pomeroy program, which does see because I had, it was just nice to have such a program that I could submit the research to in all those houses you can see it's definitely not over now <laughs> um, but um and just to do something to acknowledge some of the African American community because beyond the Solomon Northup sign which is on Broadway just in front of the visitor center I don't I don't know that there is any other signage or or mention of any of the African American community. Last summer, fortunately, the memorial bench to Lieutenant Colonel Dart was dedicated here in Coast Park. So if you have a chance to stroll through the Walk of Fame and see the military section, you might want to take a look at the bench. It's beautiful. And, and, but, but it's 2023, you know, and he, it's like, people's history just gets, you know, just left. And, and if we don't, we don't preserve or do things to help make it be, you know, be more uh, prevalent, it's just sad. You know, people, I meet people, and when I say I'm from Saratoga Springs, like, people don't believe me because they're so accustomed to it being, um, you know, so exclusive and really, and, and so white that, like, people can't conceive that anyone else could live here or grow up here. That, that to me, is so sad. I mean, honest to goodness, people think I'm lying when I say I'm from Saratoga No, you can look it up. <laughs> yes. What about the Muzan House? It's a restaurant now. Wasn't that a prominent? Use your microphone. Oh, yes. Say it again, please. The Muzan House. Right, the Muzan House, which I, I just am aware of the family, and I know Miss, Miss Mia has passed and Mr. Rocky. Um, but they were able to keep their house, and that brings up a whole nother topic on urban renewal, which we've been talking about in the community, and how so many um, homes and businesses that belong to African American families were just um, demolished, not just here in Saratoga Springs. I got to meet Regina Carter, and she has a, a she's a world-class violinist, and she has a work called um, Gone in a Phrase of Air about her community in Detroit growing up and how that was just decimated. And it's, it's been a practice nationally for folk who may not be as familiar that um, communities that are predominantly African American and even immigrant have just been destroyed, even the plaza in Albany. You know, um, I really had not known that until more recently that um, the plaza in Albany was a thriving neighborhood 
that included immigrant families and many African American families. And if you've seen some of the videos of folks who have pictures of how it was when they grew up, it's so sad. I mean, it's nice that we have the buildings and the state museum and the library, but so many people had to lose so much. And the Muzan house still stands because their family fought. They had the financial fortitude and the standing, I guess the status, you know, to, to fight back that urban renewal. And Dyer Phelps' original location was um, in that same neighborhood just across the street from the former Saratoga newspaper building. And it's, it's just um, sad to know that people's everything can just be snatched away from them because a team of people decide that that's what's going to happen. And, and you, could, you couldn't do anything about it, legally or otherwise. Anyway. Any other questions? Comments? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think I mentioned Jamie James Perillo, our executive director. Um, unfortunately, Mr. Kenzel um, wasn't unable to be here tonight, but he stopped by earlier. So thank you to everyone who helped make tonight possible. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to share. Thank you. Carol, thank you very much. Um, so we do have Carol's books um, on the table for sale, and you'd be willing to sign books too, correct? All right. And now I can actually really say good night. So good night. <laughs>